Good morning. Good morning. Our first reading is from the book of Isaiah, chapter 25, verses 6 through 9. On this mountain, the Lord of hosts will make for all peoples a feast of rich food, a feast of well-aged wines, of rich food filled with marrow, of well-aged wines strained clear. And he will destroy on this mountain the shroud that is cast over all peoples, the sheet that is spread over all nations, He will swallow up death forever. Then the Lord God will wipe away the tears from all faces, and the disgrace of his people he will take away from all the earth. For the Lord has spoken. It will be said on that day, Lo, this is our God. We have waited for him so that he might save us. This is the Lord for whom we have waited. Let us be glad and rejoice in his salvation. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. From the book of the Revelation. What we've said in our bulletin and in uh, publicity about this sermon, the Easter sermon is so important. I needed reinforcement today. So it says, Pastor Dale Southorn and guest. So another surprise for you this morning. I'll be assisted in this message in a moment. First, we'll go to the gospel and read one of the four accounts of the resurrection. This year from Matthew. After the Sabbath, as the first day of the week was dawning, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to see the tomb. And suddenly there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord descending from heaven came and rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning and his clothing white as snow. For fear of him, the guards shook and became like dead men. But the angel said to the women, do not be afraid. I know that you are looking for Jesus who was crucified. He is not here, for he is risen, as he said. Come see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples he has been raised from the dead. And indeed, he is going ahead of you to Galilee. There you will see him. This is my message for you. So they left the tomb quickly with fear and great joy and ran to tell his disciples. Suddenly Jesus met them and said, Greetings. And they came to him, took hold of his feet and worshipped him. Then Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee and there they will see me. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. On this Easter day, O God, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts together be acceptable in your sight. O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Well, I don't know when I've been more ready for spring. Those four nor'easters in March were just about more than any of us could take. And with a threat of snow tomorrow, I called our snowplow guy and said, forget it, the office is closed, don't come. We've blown the budget on snow removal (laughs) for this year. I'm ready for flowers and chocolate and the joy of spring. How about you? Easter is about new life. But Easter is also about death. Easter is about resurrection, the new life that comes after death. Good Friday was the day to remember the death of our Lord, and today is the day to celebrate his resurrection. But you can't have one without the other. But we would rather talk about life than death, wouldn't we? We certainly would rather go to church on Easter than on Good Friday or even Monday, Thursday. We're uncomfortable with death. But should we be? People have come up with all kinds of expressions to deal with that queasy feeling we get when we have to talk about death. Here are just a few of those euphemisms we've come up with. There are the old-fashioned ones like, he's given up the ghost, or pushing up daisies. There are the funny ones that mask the pain with a little humor, which is sometimes a good thing. Phrases like, he bit the dust, or kicked the can, or cashed in his chips, or 
My favorite, but I don't know what it means, he bought the farm. There are the hopeful ones like, gone to a better place, gone to the happy hunting grounds, or you name the hobby that they are now enjoying. There are religious ones like, gone to meet her maker, or join the church triumphant. You know, I thought I'd heard them all when I heard an expression for death and dying that I truly like. When I first heard Pastor Charles Barton share a prayer request for a family that had lost a loved one, hey, there's another expression, lost a loved one. When I heard that, I thought, now that says it all. That says it best. And so I've invited Charles to share with you where he came up with his expression for that word we all want to avoid talking about, death. When someone dies, you often hear me say they've experienced their final healing. I don't mind telling you I go absolutely nuts when I hear well-intentioned people refer to death as someone has passed. I immediately want to ask, past what or where? <laughs> past gas? <laughs> Past go and collect $200. Pass from life to death. And the list goes on. I suspect we're afraid to say our loved one has died when in fact they did die. And so we say they have passed to wherever we want them to go. I've come to believe death is the final healing. What a remarkable way to describe it. Almost as if it's come from God herself. I first learned of this from Morton Kelsey, an Episcopal priest who was one of the healing ministry leaders back in the late 80s and early 90s. Ever since my encounter with Kelsey, I've thought of death, even the death of those who are closest to me, as the final healing. And what a final healing it is. It's the end of the pain, discomfort, sorrow, heartache, bondage, disappointment, brokenness, and all the other deadly aspects of life as we've come to know them. What's so remarkable about this final healing is we're not the only ones who experience it. God knows what it's all about and has even walked through it. What better way to describe that brutal Good Friday execution of our Lord than to say, Jesus experienced his final healing. Of course, there was more to come, and that's why we're here today. Jesus walked through his final healing, and because he did, we can too, even to the point of walking into a life of resurrection. Dale is about to tell us Easter marks our ultimate healing, and I couldn't agree more. Easter tells us Jesus experienced the ultimate healing as he stepped out of that tomb. Easter also tells us that this healing is ours for the believing and the living. Here's what this ultimate healing means for me. Life is no longer confined to our cemeteries, cemeteries where far too many of us spend our lives. Life is once again pregnant with possibilities. You and I matter to God. We are loved by a love that never lets go. We are forgiven by a forgiveness that knows no end. We are accepted by God just as we are, warts and all. You and I 
are the most important players in God's scheme of things. There is no broken relationship that cannot be made whole. There is no hurt that cannot be healed. There is no tragedy God cannot redeem. There is no dream God cannot energize and advance. Life doesn't have to be lived in the in-betweens. Nor are we to be held hostage by our yesterdays. Life, death is no longer a dead end. This ultimate healing assures us we're no longer held captive by darkness, paranoia, emptiness, brokenness. The resurrected Jesus walks us through the dark places of our lives and frees us from whatever it is that oppresses us and holds us hostage. And why? It's all because God loves us. The miracle of the resurrection is this. God loves us as we are. There's nothing we can do to make God love us more. And there's nothing we can do to make God love us less. Sisters and brothers, this is the good news of Easter. Having walked through his ultimate healing, Jesus of Nazareth stands here and tells us, God is with you, and God is with me. And that means there's not a cemetery we can't leave or a tomb we can't walk out of. Amen. Thank you, Charles. Another surprise on this Easter day. A mini sermon within a sermon. Thank you for that, Charles. And it, Easter is not final. Easter is our final healing. Well, as Charles has shown us, death is not something we should be afraid to say or even talk about. Of course, death is and uh, can be and usually is painful. We have said a final goodbye to someone we will never see again, or will we? The women who came to the tomb that morning were full of grief and sadness. Their beloved rabbi was dead and buried. But they saw an angel and heard a message that rings down through the centuries. He is not here. He is risen. The story of Easter gives us hope that death is not the final word. Rather, it is our final healing. You know, the story of the empty tomb is not the only story of life after death. In recent decades, there have been many books written about the phenomena of near-death experiences. You know how it goes. Someone's heart stops in an accident or in surgery, and they have the perspective of leaving their body, and they see a bright light, and they are surrounded by a sense of love and complete acceptance. A little research shows that this is not just a modern phenomenon. Throughout ancient and medieval literature, there are such accounts. But what is new in our modern experience is trying to explain it. We apply the scientific method to understand what is probably beyond understanding. In 2010, a book called Heaven is for Real shared the story of a four-year-old boy who had a remarkable experience of seeing angels and, and even Jesus when he nearly died in a hospital. Like many best-selling books, it was made into a movie, and in 2014, it was featured in a Time magazine article called Beyond Death, The Science of the Afterlife. And one of my favorite saints of our church who received his final healing since we gathered last Easter, Manton Martin, shared that Time magazine article with me. Manton was always clipping out interesting articles to discuss at our men's group or over a visit or over coffee. And I'm not sure he took this phenomenon literally, but he was fascinated and curious about it. And that's why he lived to 99 and a half years. 
he stayed curious and engaged with life until he received his final healing. Scripture is full of stories and images of life beyond death and even beyond time and space. The reading from Isaiah that Cynthia read for us is a beautiful vision of what is poetically called God's holy mountain. On that mountain, Isaiah says, there will be good food and fine wine for all. Tears will be wiped away and death will be swallowed up forever. What a glorious vision of heaven. And yet there was much debate in ancient uh, Judaism if there even was an afterlife or a heaven or a hell for that matter. And even in Jesus' time, there were two schools of thought on this subject in Judaism. The Pharisees, on the one hand, believed in the resurrection, but the Sadducees did not. That's why they were sad, you see. <laughs> one midrash suggests that in eternity Moses will be teaching endlessly on the Torah and to some that sounds like heaven but to others that sounds like the very definition of hell <laughs> the prophet Isaiah offers the vision to give hope and comfort to the people of God without giving us all the details they were to trust that all things were in God's hands in the end one way or the other God will bring about healing and wholeness. Death does not get the last word. In Isaiah's story about the holy, is the, uh, Isaiah's story about the holy mountain a true story? Well, like Mark Twain said, don't let the truth get in the way of a good story. It offers comfort and hope, leaving the details to God. In the movie, Karina, Karina, a child's mother has died and her father has brought in a nanny, played by Whoopi Goldberg, to help care for his young daughter, Karina. The child's father and mother were scientists and the father was an avowed atheist. One day, he overheard Whoopi's character telling the child that her mother was in the clouds watching over her every day. And the child took great comfort in that thought, but dad overheard this and he was upset. After scolding the nanny, he took his daughter aside and told her, you know, these stories about mom watching over you, those are just things people make up to make them feel better. And the child responded without skipping a beat, I know, what's wrong with that? Friends, we have the best story ever told to make us feel better on this Easter morning. Is it a story I can prove? Not with a microscope or a video camera, but it is a true story. A story that has given hope and comfort to millions of believers throughout the millennia. It is the story that gave hope to my father as we gathered around my mother's deathbed. As her ultimate healing was near, he took her hand and said with total confidence, I'll see you in the morning, dear. I'll see you in the morning. I don't know about you, but Easter has come just in time once again. We need this story with its message of hope and healing because there is much to fear and much to grieve. There are victims of mass shootings, of police shootings, and random shootings. There are oppressed people suffering and dying in Gaza and ga countless places around the world. There are problems out there and there are problems in here. We struggle in relationships. We fear financial insecurity. We miss loved ones who have died. We fear our own death. We need a vision of hope and healing. We need a story of good trumping evil of justice prevailing, of resurrection crushing death. And in Easter, we have that story. In Easter, we have the story of the empty tomb. In Easter, we have the story of God transforming all pain and suffering into hope and joy. In Easter, we have the vision of Isaiah's holy mountain where tears are wiped away and death is swallowed up forever. In Easter, we have our story of ultimate healing. The story is simple, yet it is an eternal truth. The tomb is empty. Christ is risen. Thanks be to God. Amen.